I'm going to try to explain you about breast implant surgery and at the same time in those cases that have a sagging of the breast where the breast lift entails. If your breast is small or you lost volume after pregnancy and you want to increase the volume but the breast is not saggy, usually if the nipples are looking up or to the front, we can say in most of the cases that we can just perform breast implant surgery to deal with the concerns you have. Breast implant surgery is a very straightforward procedure that we perform under local anesthesia with just mild conscious sedation, what I call the double tequila shot. The breast implants can be placed in different manners. Num number one, the most common technique I use is soft muscular implants with what's called dual plane technique. In this case, what we do is the pectoral muscle is attached to the ribs here, to the sternum in the middle of the chest and to the clavicle up here. When we place the implant completely submuscular, it will squeeze the implant into the chest wall and it will not look nice. What we do is we separate the attachment of the muscle to the ribs and elevate the muscle to create a soft pectoral pocket. When we do this, we put the implant under the muscle so that it is covered on top by the muscle and medially along the sternum with the muscle. But down here, it is really under the mammary gland. That's what it's called a dual plane, under the gland and under the muscle. This is the most common placement of implants in our clinic. And the benefits of that is mostly in people that have very little tissue up here. The implant will have an added uh, level of tissue between the skin and the implant. The muscle will be there, providing a more natural shape, less rippling. And we think also that the massaging of the muscle will decrease the possibilities of complications with breast implant surgery. If you have a breast that is pretty full, that is at least three to four centimeters thick in the upper pole of the breast. If you elect, we can do the soft glandular technique where we don't deal with the muscle at all. And on top of the muscle, just on top of the fascia of the pectoral muscle, we place the implant. So the implant is below the gland and the skin. There's really no clear evidence that either of these two locations has any specific advantage, although some surgeons think that the incidence of capsular contracture is higher on top of the muscle, although many studies have not proven that. But if you are a thin lady, you don't have enough tissue up here, there's no other way but to do it under the muscle. I would say 90% of all my cases are under the muscle with this dual plane technique. The surgery is probably uh, is relatively fast, 45 minute to one hour cases. I usually advise if I'm going to use silicone implants to do submammary entrance is about five centimeter incision that is hiding in the fold of the breast and it usually heals in such a way that after a few months it's almost invisible. The choices of implants that you can get are the saline implant that I just don't advise my patients to have. This is probably one of the few countries in the world where they still have saline implants. My concern with saline implants is number one, the feel. They feel really hard, unnatural. They ripple much more. And most importantly, they weigh much more than a similar sized silicone implant. So my advice is really not to use this. If you are adamant about having a saline implant because you want a trans umbilical placement, meaning from the belly button, we can create a trajectory here, a path to put the implants on, uh, where they belong without a scar, or from the armpit. These are placed before filling them up with saline. So they are placed like making a little tackle so we can place them through the armpit and theoretically avoid the scar. But in my experience, these 
recovery in the armpit is much more tough than the recovery when we do it sub mammary. The other implant that we tend to use is probably our workhorse is the round silicone gel implant. This is a very sturdy implant. You cannot break it really. It's a very very well made implant. These are the fourth generation implants either from Allergan or Mentor. We can both use both. And these are implants that have what's called a high cohesive gel, meaning that if you puncture the implant, the silicone will stay in. But let me show you. Even cutting the implant in half, you can see that the silicone stays in. The benefit of this implant, four generation implant, is that the incidence of capsular contracture is much less than with the all implants, mostly the second generation breast implant that have a horrific rate of capsular contraction. I talked a little bit more about that. The other type of implants that we might be discussing with you is the anatomically shaped textured implants. These are implants that have a teardrop shape, they have a textured surface, and they have a little harder feel. I think they don't feel as natural as the round gel silicone implants, but some ladies ask about these implants. I usually advise to use this in reconstruction cases, patients that have cancer and we have to do a, uh, a breast implant to replace the mammary gland after a mastectomy. In these cases it might have some benefit, but in the general population of breast implant patients that just want it for cosmetic reasons, I think this is probably not ideal. It's too hard, a little more expensive. It has to be placed exactly in position. If it is for any reason moved after the surgery, it will adopt kind of a weird shape. And if you look at the anatomic implant, yes, it's a teardrop. But I tell my patients, well, what's the shape of this when you're standing? Pretty much a teardrop. And this you can move around all over the place and it's really not going to, to, to make a big difference if you use these ones. Now, going back to the breast implant surgery, Again, it's a 45 minute surgery, very simple. The main, I would call, side effect of a breast implant is what's called capsular contracture. Capsular contracture, every foreign substance we put in your body, pacemaker, orthopedic prosthesis, breast implant, will create a capsule. Usually this capsule is paper thin, it's formed of collagen fibers that surround the implant. When these are, when this capsule is thin, as it usually is, the, you don't feel it and the implant can be displaced and it's soft and the shape of the breast is very natural and very nice. In some instances, months or years after the implant surgery, in some patients for reasons that we are not really sure why, this capsule starts to thicken and starts to shrink creating a squeezing effect on the implant that can start to, be, to create a rounded shape, many times making the implant go up and creating a total distorted or natural appearance. And it reaches significant levels, a grade four Baker contraction, that's how we call it, it can really even cause pain. The incidence of capsular contracture with the second generation implants in the 1980s was up to 30-40% of the cases, were extremely high in 10-15 years after the implants. And I've taken care of many patients that had their implant back then, and it's really a, a, a more complicated surgery to solve the problem. With these newer implants, Mentor and Allergan give figures of four to seven, 10% incidence of capsular contraction. It varies by author and by study, but the reality is that it's much less common. Now, why is that some people still develop capsular contracture? We really don't know. Well, we think there's two main possible reasons. Number one is that during the creation of the pocket, there's too much tissue trauma, much, too much bleeding inside the pocket. The older surgical techniques to create the pocket bluntly with the fingers created a lot of pain on recovery because there was a lot of bleeding, a lot of inflammation, a lot of swelling. And besides giving a lot of pain on recovery, it would give probably higher chances of capsular contracture if, if there was too much blood in the pocket. Now, when I do the pockets nowadays, 
and I've been doing this for years now, I use what's called a lighted retractor. I cauterize every single uh, uh, blood vessel that I know where they are before the surgery, and I create the pocket almost completely bloodless. When we finish creating the pocket, that's, there's not one single drop of blood in the pocket. Hopefully, this will decrease the chances of capsular contraction but also it makes the recovery of the breast implants really a breeze. There's no pain on recovery, just mild discomfort. You can go back to your regular activities next day except for heavy exercise that you have to stay awake for about a month. We tell you to do some massaging movements of your implants, to do some exercises to expedite your recovery, and you probably can go back uh, on your regular activities ne next day with this technique of doing the pocket without any significant swelling during the procedure. The other thing that might decrease the chances of capsular contracture is what's called a no-touch technique. If we get the implant from the manufacturer, it comes in a bowl, and we just put it in, rubbing against your skin, even if we clean your skin very thoroughly, the skin still has bacteria. So it means that if we just push the implant in like the traditional techniques, we're bringing in bacteria with them. And that chronic bacterial load that is called the biofilm can probably increase the chances of capsular contraction down the road. To decrease that possibility, we use the no-touch technique. The implant is open. Just before we're going to place it, we already created the pocket. If we use sizers to see the best shape for you and size, we already irrigated your pocket with triple antibiotic solution. This same triple antibiotic solution is poured into the container where the implants come and after that the implant without touching it, it's poured into what's called a Keller funnel. This is a funnel like we're using the kitchen to make cakes and with that we have not touched the implant with our hands, it is not going to touch your skin and the implant is squeezed with this Keller funnel into the pocket and with this we think we're avoiding the possibility of bacterial contamination. We will be sure if these two techniques, the bloodless technique and the no-touch technique combined, can really decrease the chances of capsular contraction, but we will know that in, what, 20 years from now. It's a relatively new technique that we have been using for the last three or four years. As I said before, the recovery should be very easy and there should be minimal pain on recovery. You can go back to your regular activities the same day or next day and we just ask you to not do heavy exercise. Possible complication of breast implant surgery, infection, bleeding, perforating the chest wall and creating a pneumothorax. Those are mentioned in the consent form that you will be thoroughly advised to read and to discuss with us but the chances of that happening are extremely low if proper surgical technique is done. The scar is closed with subcuticular sutures that are absorbable, so we don't have to remove sutures. We just leave a tape there for two weeks, three weeks, as long as it stays, to try to flatten the scar as much as possible. So when the tape is removed, you will have a very flat, small, and nice scar. You can use some scar creams that we can advise. And in some cases, if we think there's a higher chance of capsular contraction for, for whatever reason, we will advise you to take two possible medications, high dose vitamin E that apparently decreases the chance of these collagen bundles to be very strong after the surgery, or to take an asthma medication called Accolade that is a leukotriene an inhibitor that decreases the inflammatory response to the foreign drug. We have seen that in some cases that we have seen with early capsular contracture, the use of Accolade for three to six months has softened the implants, not the implant, but the shell surrounding the implant, the capsule around the implant, and it has prevented us from having to do surgery. Now, in those of you that have very saggy breasts, placing the implants without doing a lift will create what's called the Snoopy Dog deformity implant up here and the breast gland hanging there. That's a really ugly situation. In those cases, we will advise you to do a breast augmentation together with the breast lift. It's called an augmentation mastopexy. My usual routine is to do two main techniques, 
if we just have to really move the areola and nipple up, we just do the peri areolar mastopexy. We move the areola from, from where it is, low and sometimes out. We move it up and in. And with this, we just leave a circum areolar scar that usually heals very nicely. And through that same place, we place the implant either subpectoral or subglandular. Now, in those of you that have much more sagging, I advise to do the circum vertical technique that we do a scar around the areola and one down the breast. It's called the lollipop scar. Usually, again, this is a scar that heals very nicely. And with this technique, what I do is when once I create the scar here and I open the breast, I remove a wedge of tissue in the lower breast, the breast that is sagging, and we create what's called a medial and a lateral pillar of breast tissue. And these two pillars are brought together to create a very strong support for the implant they were placing on top of it. With this tissue, we're creating support not just with the skin surgery, but with the breast parenchyma serving as the main support for the breast. I try to avoid the most commonly performed technique that is called the wise pattern mastopexy that involves the anchor scar that is around the nipple, around the breast, and all around the inframammary fold. I think that is the scar that heals the worst, and I don't think it is necessary unless I have to do a case with massive giganto, gigantomasty, meaning huge, enormous breast, we might have to do a wise pattern mastopexy. But in the most of the our cases, I do well with just a periareolar or the circumvertical mastopexy. The results are very, very nice. If the scar is not looking the right way after the procedure or a few months later, we can use some laser techniques to try to improve the quality of the scar. The recovery after a mastopexy or a breast lift with implants is pretty much the same as if we were doing just implants. There's minimal pain, recovery is simple. And we just ask you to stay away from heavy exercise for about a month. There's no need to have any special compression. We just use the same tape we use for the implants, regular implants, and we leave the tape again for three weeks, a month, until it is necessary to remove it. The stitches are subcuticular and absorbable, so we don't have to remove stitches. We will show you before and after pictures of similar cases as yours, so you can see what is the best option for you. And we have a special system called the Vectra Photography System where, where we can take a special three-dimensional picture of your breast and show you how it would look like with different sized implants. And we will also give you special sizers to show you how you would look. So you can choose the best option for your breast implants. We always encourage you to follow our advice in regards to the size of your implant based on your tissue characteristics. If you put a very small implant in tissue that is way too distended, it's going to look like a sock with a ball in, in it, it's not nice. Or if you put a too large an implant, you, you can develop a lot of complications like damage to the fourth intercostal nerve with lack of nipple sensation, uh, stretch marks on the breast, and most importantly down the road, significant heaviness and a natural look of your breast with progressive sagging of your breast. So if you follow our advice to use your own measurements to give you the ideal size implant, you will be very happy and more long-term good results. Once you review your pictures, we'll show you the different options within that range of sizes. And I always ask my patients to let me do sizers during the procedure to see which one size and type of implant fits you the best so we can give you the most perfect solution. Uh, the consent form again, you will be receiving the consent form through an email once you schedule your procedure. I encourage you to read it very thoroughly. There's many uh, scary things in the informed consent that can happen. Surgery is always a risk, but these risks are minimized if surgery is done properly. Uh, once you uh, read your informed consent, you are asked to come for your pre-op evaluation. This is about 10 days before your surgery, in which we are going to do a complete lab work, EKG, uh, physical exam, 
we're going to answer any questions you have about your informed consent and again discuss every issue mostly emphasizing the possibility of capsular contracture and once you understand everything involved in your procedure you are going to be uh, finally scheduled for your procedure the day of your procedure we're going to again discuss with you everything so if there's no questions in your mind about that of course you have you will have already reviewed before and after pictures of cases very similar to yours that way you really can have realistic expectations about your results the follow-up is critical we want you to be trying to follow our advice to be coming to your appointments as often as we require you to so we can really see any possible complication early and fix it before it gets uh, any more significant. Our incidence of complications after breast surgery are extremely small, pretty much minimal, but we want to make sure that everything is smooth with you and you are very happy with your result. Thank you.